Because technically, each one of us has been separated onto the gospel. And when you're separated into the gospel, God doesn't just leave you alone to do the work by yourself. He gives you the seal of the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit is given, you are sealed. Have you, ever, have you ever bought something and it gets stamped by the manufacturer being authentic? Well, when, God, when you have the Holy Spirit of God, that makes you a real Christian. And if you don't have the Spirit of God, you're not a real Christian. That means you need to be the real Christian. It's a genuine, uh, and the Lord really sh you know, reveals himself uh, through the scriptures. But when he gives you the Holy Spirit, the Bible says you have no need of any man to teach you, for the Holy Spirit himself will teach you all things. And when you, the Apostle Paul, again, went to Arabia and spent two years out in the desert with God. And guess who taught him the scriptures? The Lord did. God the Holy Spirit. So we know, in verse 3 says, Concerning Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made in the seed of David according to the flesh. The seed of David, guys, is, again, the promise. The promise of the Messiah. Uh, if you read the book of Matthew, uh, chapter 1, and the book of Luke, chapter 1, we have two different genealogies. We have one coming uh, from Matthew to, to the mom, and, and in the book of Luke from, from, um, from his stepdad. Uh, Joseph, the genealogy, and both, you might say, two different branches of the same tree, but they both went back to David, being the promised Messiah, and then from David, they went back all the way to Abraham, because remember, God is the God of Isaac, Abraham, and Jacob, but I like to say God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, because we know Jacob was transformed to Israel, and uh, again, verse 4 says this, and through the scriptures, he declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection of the dead, by whom we receive grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. Verse 6, among whom we have also been called of Jesus Christ to all that are in Watsonville, beloved of God, called to be saints, Grace to you and peace from God, from our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, grace and peace. Uh, I, uh, they call it the Siamese twins. The Siamese twins of prophecy. Uh, I'm sorry, the Siamese twins of, 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 of the New Testament. Because in life, guys, you can't have grace without peace. You can't experience God's peace without God's grace. And that's what happens when, when God... Uh, the, your gospel is revealed. The gospel is revealed. And what happens is you start realizing there's nothing you can do to earn your salvation. How's that? Is that better? Yes. There's nothing you can do to, to, to earn your salvation. There's absolutely, let me say it again. There's absolutely nothing you can do to earn your salvation. There's nothing. Other than to have faith in what God our Savior did for us. You know, once you come to that realization that the Lord is for us, you realize that throughout the Old Testament, you know, God has always been promising the Messiah. You know, the, the Messiah, the Messiah, the Messiah, throughout the Old Testament. Remember, everybody was waiting for the Messiah, but when he showed up, what happened? They killed him. Why? Why? Because he had to die according to the scriptures. Because there was only one remission of sins, and that was through Jesus Christ our Lord. Why did God come and die for us? Because people are on the broad way to hell. You know, we come to church, and it's kind of nice, but you have to realize that there's a lot of people out there who are going to hell. And the scriptures warn us. Not only warn us, they... they uh, speak very loudly concerning the fate of those who die uh, in eternity without the Lord. And Paul says that God came to declare himself, to declare Jesus Christ, to declare salvation, to declare the good news, which is the gospel. The gospel. The gospel. The gospel is great news, guys. There's, there's, a, there, there's a separation that happens. Your life is transformed. 
You desire to do things that uh, normally you would never do. You know, when you see somebody hurting, you actually stop and you want to t converse and talk to them. You want to help them. When you see somebody on the street, you feel their pain. You know, you don't overlook uh, uh, things that you might have overlooked before. You know, because we're all, this world is a big, long rat race of the Bible calls a broad road, and many are going down, down through it. And Paul, and, and Paul was given the task to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. The Gentiles! The Gentiles! The Gentiles! Those heathen people who worship statues and, and all these things that are, the Bible says are, are an abomination before the Lord. And the Lord says, hey, 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 I am doing a work. Trust me. Trust me in this. And he's like, how can God do a work in them? How can God do a work in them? Take my jacket. See if that helps. You know, when you when you personalize the scriptures, you're changed. You start seeing your life, you start seeing the future. You start seeing things around you prophetically. Paul Again, was religious of religious people. He was a Benjamite of Benjamins. He was part of the Sanhedrin, the mighty council. He had given, he had a ring that gave him authority to go into anywhere he wanted to and bring those Christians and bring them to the court, you know, the, the high priest. And, you know, he says, You preach that name of Jesus Christ? Don't. You, you're, I command you not to preach. And, and, and what do the apostles say? Whether it be right or wrong, I'm not going to listen to you. I'm going to listen to God. You know? Right now, the society around us says, you don't preach Jesus Christ in the secular part of the world. I'm oh, really? Oh, really? We don't preach Jesus Christ. Tell that to Apostle Paul and Peter and James and all these other guys. You're not allowed to preach Jesus Christ. Don't you know separation of church and state? I'm sorry, brother. I don't know the difference because I don't belong. I am no, I, my citizenship is from heaven. When the day I was born again, Chewy knows he was there. My mom was there in my backyard. Something happened. First of all, I know that I, that I was comforted. And the Bible calls the comforter the Holy Spirit. Second thing I know is that, that I, th this wind came upon me that I've not, I remember that very, it was weird, but I heard the voice of the Lord the first time in my life. And then, you know what the Lord says? I see you there. And I, he's seen whatever you're going through. Listen, Paul was going to Damascus. He, God seen what he was going through. God seen his heart. And he took, God took his time in the middle of the daylight. The Bible says it was noon. And he, and he appeared himself. God still appears today many, 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 many times. He appears to you in scriptures. He appears to you in the small, still voice when he speaks to you concerning something in your life. He speaks to you when you're heading down the wrong road and the Lord's like, Hey, where are you going to go? Why are you walking that direction? The Bible says, don't what? What are you doing hanging out with those people? Right? The Bible says these things, and the word of the word of the Lord speaks to you. Right? You don't, you know, God also uses other people to speak to you, right? Right? And the Apostle Paul, again, was on his road, on his high horse, you might say. He was on a high horse. And what happened? God threw him off. That horse. And he blinded him, correct. You know, sometimes we need to be blinded. Have you ever been blindsided by something? You didn't see it coming, and it totally took you for a tailspin? But you could trust the Lord in all things. Right? That's what happens. You can trust the Lord. That's what walking by faith means. It means during the being blindsided. Rocked. Whoa, I didn't see that coming. But 
but knowing you can trust the Lord in it. Because he's a cornerstone. He's a cornerstone. Remember, the apostle Paul was now born again. Later on, he would go to Ananias. He would get, he would, he would you know, lay hands on him and just tell him how much he must suffer. And he knew. But one thing happened. Paul was now behind enemy lines. You were behind enemy lines? The enemy desires to take you out. Get this straight right here. We're in the spiritual battle. If you don't know the equipment, you don't know the word of God, you don't got prayer, you don't have devotion, you don't give, you know, you, you don't, you know, one of the best ways to get your heart right, guys, is, is realize that everything you have doesn't belong to you. You know, some of the old pastors used to say, you know, he says, oh, pastor, you have so much. He says, how do you have so much? He says, because I give it away. Everything I have, I give it away. I, 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 I put very uh, light touches on everything I know because, like Job said, naked I came into the world, and naked I shall leave. It doesn't matter what you're going through. It doesn't matter. Uh, sometimes we have a tendency to believe that our circumstances are so overwhelming that God can't do a work. That's what, what do you think the word miracle means? What do you think you can't have a miracle without a problem? And again, the Apostle Paul shows us that he could be transformed by the living Christ. And he does this for our edification. He does this for our growth. And most of all, he does it for our well-being. And when we trust the Lord in all things, he's able to transform your life. He's able to make your light shine. He's able to make you become a salt. And once you're a salt... Guess what happens? You draw people onto you. You know, there's people in here that I minister to. Years. You know? Years. And, and I, I knew God wanted me to tell them, to encourage them. Whatever they were going through. Some of these people had hard times. But they were able to trust the Lord in it. Because only God, who is the God outside of time, can give you the right, the, the right revelation that each one of us needs. And the Apostle Paul here says, hey, you know, the same power that resurrected Jesus from the grave shall transform your life from light to darkness. Amen? Amen. So let's get into it. Uh, I want to get way into more uh, chapter 1 and chapter 2 because th this is what I believe the Lord's message for us tonight is. And you know what that message is? You're going to find out. He says, verse 8, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all, that your faith is spoken throughout the whole world. For God is my witness, whom I serve, with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I may mention you always in my prayers. Question. Question. Do you pray? Do you pray for others? The Apostle Paul says, Hey, I always make mention to you for you in my prayers. Oh, by the way, Lord, I pray for so-and-so, so-and-so, and so-and-so. Oh, Lord, you know, my pastor always tells me, how is, it, how is it that sometimes I see things that other people don't see because the Lord is revealing it to you so you can pray for them? Yeah. It's like, whoa! That's how simple it is. A lot of times I don't confront them. I don't even talk to them about what's going on. But the Lord reveals to me what's going on. I say, okay, Lord, you want me to pray? Go to your closet. If, you know, you know. Remember, prayer is trusting God. What did Jesus do with it right before he went to Calvary? He prayed. Oh, Father, if that be thy will, let this cup pass from me. What is he doing? He's praying. Oh, Lord, Peter. Guys, pray for me. Pray with me for one hour. Sometimes you're going to be alone, guys. But that's when your greatest strength is going to come from because your strength is going to come from the Lord. Amen? No matter your circumstances, you have, if you're born again, you have a direct access to the mighty throne room of grace in the Lord. 
say, hey, I mentioned to you, always, always pray for you. Verse 10, making request, if by any means now at length I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. Remember, guys, another word for journey is the word workmanship. You know, God is doing a work in your life. It doesn't matter which way you travel, the workmanship is what God has preordained for your life. When you can trust the Lord and uh, the fu your future, if you can trust the Lord that He came through in your past, He can come through in your future. Amen? You know? And he says, hey, whatever I'm going through, I want to come to Rome, uh, but you know what? I'm going to trust the Lord in this. And in verse 11 it says, For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift, to the end that you may be established. Okay, from 12, I'm going to go pretty quick to, through 18, uh, 17, uh, because today's main ver verse... Uh, context I believe the Lord wants to speak to us is going to be in this, so uh, bear with me. It says, For I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift, to the end ye may be established. That is, that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith, both you and me. Now I would want you to be stupid, or I'm sorry, ignorant, brethren, uh, that oftentimes I supposed to come on to you, but wasn't allowed to. Even so, uh, even though among the Gentiles, for I am a debtor to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as what is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes the Jew first, and also the Greek. So, so God says, hey, I don't want you to be ignorant. Ignoramus. I don't want you to be a, a, a dumb concerning this, basically. Another word for ignorance, sometimes people say, I don't want to see it, I don't want to see it, I don't want to know it, I don't want to see it. If I don't know it, I can't be judged for it, or if I don't see it, remember, uh, the Samaritan fell by the wayside and the Pharisee came and he said he hid his face. That's the word ignorant. Ignorant. He didn't want, he didn't want to uh, uh, see it. If he didn't see it, then he had to act, right? Well, in Romans, God wants you not to be ignorant concerning these next couple of scriptures. Okay? So I'm going to read uh, 16 and 17. It says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, The just shall live by faith. So, what does it mean to be a debtor? That means he has to preach it. What does it mean to be ready to give an answer to all those who say? Why, why is it you have faith? I mean, think about it. I mean, you have you're not you don't have too much to offer, but why is it you have the faith? Why does he say I'm not ashamed? Some of you guys are ashamed. You say, Oh, I'm not ashamed, I'm all you preach it? Are you ready? No, you guys are quiet. Right? I say, oh, I said some. Are you ready to preach the gospel? Do you testify? Do you testify? Yes. Do you testify? Remember, this is an exhortation. An exhortation is when someone challenges you to, if you're on level two, to get to level three. If you're on, 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 on a level five, I want you to be in the penthouse. I want you to grow in your, in your walk. I'm not ashamed. 
I'm not ashamed. Secular world, I am not ashamed. You can't save Jesus. I just did. And he loves you, bro. And he died for you. And he died on that cross for my sins and your sins. But the difference is, I put my sins on the cross of Calvary upon my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who took away my sins and gave me the robe of righteousness. A white robe. He's giving me a crown. He's giving me eternal life. I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation, my brothers. You know, we can, we can, we, we you know, uh, uh, we can, we can kind of be, you know, we're Christian, you know. But when the time comes, the end times are coming, guys. The end times are coming. The end times are coming. Things like we used to be are not always going to be the way they used to be. The America my mom grew up in, or the America I grew up again, is, is, is fading away. There's globalism coming in. There's a cashless society. There's uh, the mark of the beast system. There's the antichrist. There's the false prophet. There's the falling away. You don't hear this in churches anymore. Because why? Because it's, they're ashamed. Because it's not politically correct. I don't care if it's politically correct. I'm going to be biblically correct. And I'm going to preach the light while there's light. And the Bible says, hey, I am not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God unto salvation. To the Jew. To the Jew first. And then to the Gentile. What does that mean? Israel had a spiritual, 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 I'm sorry. They had a national advantage over the Gentiles. But spiritually, no. When they came to, when Jesus came, what happened? They denied him. Why did they deny him? Because they didn't know him. Why didn't they know him? Think about it. They didn't know him. If they knew him, you think they would have crucified him? This is really God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? And what did Philip say in the book of Acts? He says, you guys, you guys are just like your forefathers. You say you're all in love with the Lord, but your forefathers prosecuted the prophets and stoned them and killed them. And now Jesus is here and you do the same thing. Listen, guys, when you preach the gospel in season, out of season, that means when it's popular and when it's not. There's going to be people who say, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. Remember, it's not you they reject, it's the Lord. You know, uh, uh, kumbaya, uh, let's all get along and, and church service. No, church is for the edification, the discipleship of the saints. So you can go out there. Most people don't go out there. They don't even go to church. They sit behind the television and they become church pew potatoes. That's it. You know, they think that's their Christianity. No, 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 no. Where is, I mean, where is your, 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 your when a time comes, where, where is your walk? Where is your walk? You know? Where is it? Where? There's needs there, 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 there. I mean, there's people who, who live here and call them Christians. Never once in 20 years have they testified to their neighbor about the Lord Jesus Christ. Never. Once. Once. They're Sunday Christians. You know, they're just comfortable. True Christianity is not comfortable. It's gonna, you're going to be challenged. Because why? The wrath of God is coming. Against all unrighteousness. All unrighteousness. This has nothing to do with our sins, by the way. It has to do with the whole society in general. We're going to read the next verse. Understand that the gospel is God's power. There are two standards by which God's power is measured in the Bible. In the Old Testament, it was according to the power which God brought Israel out of Egypt. Remember, the, remember God told Moses, I'm going to show yourself mightily strong. And what did he do? He came against Pharaoh. Guess who the Pharaoh of this world is? Satan. The same gospel that went against Pharaoh will come against satanic principalities and powers and dominions in high places. Oh, we don't want to get into that. Come on, guys.
In the Greek word, the power that God gives us is called, the, it's the Greek word dynamo, which means dynamic or dynamite. It is both a constructive power and a destructive power. It's both. That's why the Bible says God's word is a double-edged sword. What does that mean? Double-edged? Both sides. To one, it saves. Oh, God, you're going to receive Jesus Christ. You know, you're, you know you need to be saved. Uh, oh, Lord, I'm a sinner. Yes, you are a sinner. Right? And then to the other ones, oh, I have no need of the Lord. I am my own king in my own way. I have a degree. I make $100,000 a year. I have... My 401k. I have everything. I have no need of. I don't even believe those fairy tales. Well, that sword is going to come one day and whoo! Judgment. 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 They're going to stand before the white throne judgment. White throne. White throne. That means God's purity. Can you imagine standing in front of the pure holiness of the Lord? And you say, I don't believe in you. Doesn't matter if you don't believe in me. Depart from me for you work of iniquity. Go to a place prepared. It's called hell. And hell gave up their dead. Oh, what, that goes, what are those people doing? They're coming out of hell. Oh, they're just coming to get judged. And what happens after the judge? Who makes it? Let me guess. Everybody is guilty. Everybody who goes to the white throne judgment is guilty, guys. Everybody. Everybody. And the Bible says, and all those people were thrown into the lake of fire. Where there's gnashing of teeth. Oh, we're, CC, we're, we're, we're a secret sensitive church. We don't talk about hell or sin. Oh, but the Bible does. The Bible does. Remember, guys, when we have the gospel, it produces righteousness. You know, the word simply defined here is the right clothing. That's what it means. Righteousness means right clothing. And we get that from Hebrews, uh, uh, Genesis chapter 3, verse 10. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13. And Revelation 3, verse 17. 17. Some sinners realize that this is an attempt to make their own suit of spiritual clothes. And that's what religion is, guys. Making up your own clothing. You know? That's why when Adam and Eve sinned, the first thing they did is they brought up fig leaves and they covered themselves. You know, self-righteous works. People says, oh, Islam is a false religion. I say, no, it's not. It's a religion. All religions are false. It doesn't matter what religion you call it. All religions are false because Jesus said, if you worship me, you must worship me in spirit and in truth. That means you must be born again. This happens when we receive Jesus Christ and he comes into our heart and dwells and he, and he abodes in our lives. You know, we, we have a tendency to think, oh, you know, I have just enough of Jesus. You have enough of Jesus, but how much does Jesus have of you? That is the question for tonight. Because there's a time coming when darkness is going to take over the land. God says that there's a time coming when the rapture of the church is going to happen. We don't know the day or the hour, but we're getting closer and closer and closer. And that rapture of the church, the Bible likens it to a... a the biggest, greatest, awesomest. We're going to meet the Lord in the air. And he's going to say, come on. We're going to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And we're going to be in heaven. While everybody here on earth, by the way, who you didn't minister to. And was left behind. And the Bible says, and, I, and those people I will require of you. Those people's blood will be on your hands. If we didn't warn them. He didn't warn him. That is correct. But people don't warn. You know, people are just, you know, the enemy wants you to fight over this, over that. Divide and conquer. Whatever it is. 
That's what the enemy wants you to do. And God does not want you. He wants you to be, stay the course, my friend. Stay the course. You know, go to Bible study. Go to a, a fellowship. Be part of a, a church so you can grow in your discipleship. So you can be ministered to. So you can go around you and say, you know what? You know, I'm getting old. I don't know how many years I have left. But Lord, there's an old story. Jesus said this. Two guys, two guys were, let's say one was John and one was Chewy. And God said, hey, I want you to go over there and work on the vineyard. And John left and says, oh, yes, Lord, I'm going to go. And Chewie said, no, nah, no, nah, you know what? No, nah, it's okay. You know, I'm, I'm going to do what I have to do. But John, three quarters of the way, said he was going to do it and didn't do it. And Chewie said, was hanging back at this house, and he got convicted. And he says, you know what? I'm going to go do it. Yeah. Who was the one that did the Lord's will? The one that said he was going to go and didn't, or the one who didn't and went? Chewy. Chewy. You know, some people some people say, yeah, I'm going to do this for the Lord, and they don't do nothing. They don't do nothing. It's all up here. Nothing. Do they, I mean, think about it. Do they really care about their own children? I only got one kid. I only have one. So my heart and my job is not that how much harder than having ten kids. But hey. I told my son, the new world order is coming. The last days are going to gain speed. These are, these are up. Oh, dad. It doesn't matter. I love my son. What do you do when you listen when you warn them? If you don't warn them, do you really love them? Do you really believe what you believe in? Because listen what the Bible says. We're going to keep going. And this is, this is, I asked the Lord tonight that, you know, a little somber message but I wanted, his, I wanted more of the terror of the Lord. Because that's, you know, about, what does the Bible say about wisdom? The fear of the Lord is the what? Fear of the Lord is the what? The beginning of wisdom. Let's read this. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. What does that mean? How can you hold the truth in unrighteousness? Because these people think they know the truth, but they don't act on it. Right? Right? They hold the truth, so they have the Bible, but they don't act on it. And it says here, Because that which we have been known of God manifests in them. For God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things from creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even the eternal power of the Godhead, so that they are without excuse. You know, even if people don't preach the gospel, but they do, but God, God in His wisdom has he says, hey, even nature reveals that there's a creator in creation. Think about that. How is God, God's wrath is revealed from heaven? On all unrighteousness. Verse 21. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither they were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and in their foolish hearts were darkened. They professed to be wise. They professed to be wise. They professed to be wise. They profess to be wise, but they're not wise. That's what the Bible's saying. There's people who think they're wise. I know all things. But when it comes down to it, when it comes to the Word of God, they're not wise. Why are they not wise? The good news. This good news tells us that how God makes us right in His sight, this is accomplished from start to finish by faith, as the scriptures say, it is through faith that a righteous person has life. They try to do it through religion. They try to do it through the sacraments, forgive me. They try to do it through uh, uh, 
some kind of ritual. It's your faith. Abraham was justified by faith. Isaac was justified by faith. Peter was justified by faith. Paul was justified by faith. Joseph was justified by faith. Job was justified by faith. Hebrews, what do they call it? The Hall of Faith. Right? And now, now that we're more smart, we're being justified by doing our first communion. No. It's not in the Bible. It's your faith. You can do the first communion, it's fine. There's nothing wrong with it. But the communion doesn't save you. It's your faith. But what do you put your faith on? What do you put your faith on? What do you put your faith on? There's thousands, there's millions of people today, guys, on their way to hell that put their faith in idols. They hold the truth in unrighteousness. Anybody know what the difference between unrighteousness and godliness? They profess themselves to be wise and became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into the image made of corruptible men and of birds and of four-footed beasts and creeping things. When God gave them up to uncleanness through their lusts of their own hearts to dishonor themselves. Listen, guys. The Bible says that the just shall live by faith. Amen? The just. The justified. The word justified means just as if I never sinned. Been, been quoted. This is up here, up your Riga Canyon. But it's also right here at the Catholic Church. But it's also right here in people's homes. It's also here. So God says, hey, I want you to know this. That there's things around you that you are behind enemy lines that the Apostle Paul says, hey, you know, we're going to, we're going to preach to the Greeks. We're going to preach to the barbarians and the heathens. But understand, we're, cut, we're bringing them out of darkness into light, not giving them the light and sending them back to darkness. Back to darkness. In the Old Testament, they worshiped Moloch. They offered their children to baby sacrifices. It doesn't change. Satan wants you to worship things that are evil, that don't have no power. Understand that they changed. They changed the glory. They changed the glory. Listen, guys. They preferred idols to the living God. They preferred idols to the living God. They preferred idols to the living God. They preferred idols to the... They didn't change God. Listen to what the Bible says. They exchanged. They exchanged. They traded it in. You're correct. They changed the glory of the Lord. These people call it, they're lovers of wisdom, the Bible says. They changed the glory of the Word of God. They exchanged. They exchanged. It says, no, ungodliness and Unrighteousness. Let me tell you the difference. And this is how I learned it. God gave the Ten Commandments. Five was the relationship between us and God. And the other five commandments were the relationship between us and man. Correct? So ungodliness is having, exchanging that relationship with God. First, what is the first commandment? Thou shalt have no other gods before thee. No other gods, by the way. 
No other gods. No other gods. Thou shalt not make graven images of forfeited beasts and animals. They exchanged. They exchanged. The first five commandments, they exchanged all those things. And they said, that's why when, when, when Moses was up in, the, up in the mountain, and when he was given the Ten Commandments, right away they made a golden calf. It's just natural. It's natural for the unnatural. Listen, listen, Jesus said this. Let the dead worship the dead. Amen? A dead person is going to worship dead things. This is not true, guys. This has a form of godliness, but it denies the power of being born again. This is all ritual. You're not going to go to heaven. This doesn't bring you closer to God. Thou shalt make no graven images. Graven images, what is that? That means pictures, pictures of idols. This is my Jesus. This is my Mary. This is my saint. Whatever it is, it doesn't matter what it is. I'm a Catholic all my life, 24 years old, but I am not going to exchange what the Lord has given me to say, oh, it's okay. You worship God, I worship God. You worship God, how you worship God. No. I, we've been given a task. We've even been given authority. We've been given the Holy Spirit. We've been given a down payment. Why? To be lights and salts in a dark, demonic, fallen world. It's not. It's a spiritual battle. The devil is winning. Not, he's not winning, he, but he, he, he seems to be winning because it's everywhere. It's everywhere. It's everywhere, but it's okay. You know what? But God, how many times in the Bible, it seemed like the devil was winning, and all of a sudden, God won. Yeah. Haman wasn't coming against all the children of Israel. The next very day, all of them were going to be killed. God changed it like that. <clears throat> the new world over is coming. <clears throat> but remember, the Bible says they've been given authority by God and the devil, but they're going to be used, God's going to use them as an instrument of judgment. Right? <laughs> so, you know, we're in the last days. We're in the last days. It doesn't matter what it is. The Lord says, don't bow down to him. And that's what the book of Romans is telling you guys. You're exchanging with God. Why does he start right at the beginning? He says, that's not very nice, Paul. You should butter them up first before you give them a hard lesson. No, the Apostle Paul said no. Right away, boom. God's wrath is revealed from heaven on all unrighteousness. And those who hold the truth of God in ungodliness. Why? Because he was taking a stand. And remember Paul many times went into the churches. Is this the same Paul that writes these letters? He looks feeble. He looks... Because there was the Spirit of God dwelling in Paul. Paul was transformed. Remember, in the Old Testament, they changed, they preferred idols to the living God and exchanged for no man, no angel or demon can do this. His glory, nobody. A, a, a demonic man can't exchange God's, God's glory. He could try. But we know that man, in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, the Greeks worship the human body. It's kind of like Hollywood today. You know, the the birds, the Assyrians did. They bowed down to birds. The birds. The beasts. The Bible says that the Egyptians looked at cows and crocodiles like God. Note, uh, it's a down, downward spiral. A trend, a man described here in, in Romans chapter 1, verse 23, the Bible teaches the evolution, not evolution. Man is, being, is crumbling. We're in the last days, guys. The corner, what happens when you're in a, you get a building and the, you, you, you come off the cornerstone? We, human society is collapsing, guys. 
You know, you're here tonight so you can be stirred up. That's what the church is here for, for the edification of the body. You know, they want you to say, no, 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 you, you can't say that. Oh, really? Oh, you can't do that. Oh, really? You know, the Bible says that, that the Bible teaches that, that this world is not going to get better. This world is going to get worse. And the Bible says there's a great delusion coming. And the Bible says this, that they're going to be so delusional that they will believe a lie. They will believe a lie. Think about that. God is going to give them to a reprobate mind. You know what a reprobate mind is, guys? You don't hear it too much unless you're reading from Scripture. A reprobate mind is, is, is not even the right words or the right things. There's nothing that gets you. You're just heading down the broad road and you're just going to go down that road no matter what. How many times you say, oh, if you're going to hell, I'm going to hell because all my friends are going to be there. <laughs> oh, really? You, do you know hell wasn't made for man? Hell was made for the devil and his angels. For the devil and his angels. And what is the word unrighteousness? Wickedness, envy, murder, covetousness, debate. Contentions, whisperers, backbiters, God haters, despiteful, disrespectful to parents, proud, boasters, evil inventors, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. Listen, guys, if they knew the seriousness of their crimes, they wouldn't continue down that road, would they? But the Bible says this, and this is where I wanted to take us tonight. If you read Romans chapter 1, 18 through Romans chapter 4, verse 25. So now we're talking about chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, and chapter 4 of Romans. I'm going to give you an overview. You ready? We know there's a Supreme Court on earth. But there's a bigger supreme court in heaven. The Bible says here, there's a court record. Believe it or not, guys, God's word is evidence in the court of law. God's holy court. Right? And this word of God says this. Who are the defendants? If there's a court, there has to be defendants, right? The defendants are the heathen, the pagan man. Romans chapter 118 through 32. The other defendants in this court of law is the hypocrite. And the Bible calls the hypocrite the moral man. I don't need God. I'm a good enough person. That is the hypocrite. And the last person who was a defendant is the Hebrew man. The religious man. I do my religious duty. I did my first communion. I did my, uh, my confirmation. I did my baptism. I got married in the church. I'm a good and moral person. But they're not born again. That's the whole problem. The religious man. Defendant. Okay? Here's the charge. Are you ready? The charge is high treason against the king of the universe. High treason. Randy Savage, right? I like Randy Savage. High treason. So you got the defendants over here. The moral man, the religious man, and the pagan. And the district attorney says, what is the charge? He says, high treason against the king of the universe. And who is the presiding judge? The Lord Jesus Christ, John chapter 5, verse 22, and Acts 17, 31. Who is the judge? Jesus. What is the detailed indictment? Listen to this. 
God's fierce wrath is revealed against all ungodliness, sins against his person, and all unrighteousness, sins against his will. The first category is a vertical, while the second is a horizontal in nature. Listen to what it says. This wrath is manifested in a threefold way. First of all, in the biblical accounts itself, John 3.36. Another uh, uh, thing that the Lord shows us that uh, God's wrath is revealed is at the cross of Calvary. Jesus died and took God's wrath on the cross. Think about that. That is the verdict. God sent His only begotten Son that whosoever should believe in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God's will, will, wrath is revealed in the death of His only begotten Son. Three. In the natural world, through tornadoes, earthquakes, famines, etc., you see all this stuff happening in America with, with floods and hurricanes and famines and pestilence and people getting, oh, the flu, he died of the flu. What the hell? Excuse me. <laughs> Who dies from the flu? This is not right. Something's wrong. We're in the end, end times, guys. End times. Who the hell dies for the flu, right? But people are dying. People are dying all over the place. People are overdosing with fentanyl. People are overdosing on meth. People are overdosing over here. I want them to be saved, but if they die, I don't care if they do drugs, but I, I rather them not and get saved. I don't know, I'm not that harsh. No. But listen to this. The indictment of man, God against man is tenfold. So now we have the district attorney talking. We have the religious man, the moral man, and the pagan. And this is his tenfold against him. He says, one, they held him, they held down the truth. That is an indictment from the Lord. Luke chapter 4, verse 42, and 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 6 and 7. That they hold the truth in unrighteousness, guys. God don't like that. You see, you see this happening. The people around you and the people are uh, on their knees worshiping a statue. And you say, hey, bro, you know, I got the Bible here. You'll do a lot better than just doing this. I know this is, this is what you've been taught. But, you know, read the word and it says, hey, it's, don't do that. Read this. Oh, you can't say that. How can you be so mean? That's, that's, you're being unkind. Unkind, he's going to hell. Not because he's worshiping the statues, because he doesn't believe in this word of God that's able to save him and transform his soul and be born again. They hold the truth in unrighteousness. One. Two. They knew God, but they didn't honor him as God. This is the God. Bow down and worship him. This is an idol. By the way, in the, in, in the tribulation, in the tribulation, the Antichrist is going to make a, a statue and, and, and tell everybody to worship it. And those who don't worship it is going to be, have their head cut off. Well, guess what it is? It's an idol. It doesn't change. The end times are coming. The beast of Revelation is going to say, the false prophet is going to say, worship the beast in his image. His image. Idolatry. Why, what, how is God's wrath revealed? Because they wished they knew God, but they didn't worship Him as God. Three, they were unthankful. Romans chapter 1, verse 21. They were unthankful. They had God. Yes, you get, you, we go through struggles. Yes, we go through heartaches. Yes, we go through tribulations and trials and stuff. But in the trials, they were unthankful. These are believers, but how about the other people who are not believers? They think they have money, they have this, so I have, you know, whatever, right? If they don't go to church, if they don't read their Bible, if they don't have fellowship with Jesus, are they because they're spiritually dead or because they don't, just don't care in their own thing? And that's what it is. 
four. They began foolish speculations. Romans chapter 1, verse 21, the Bible says that they were vain in their imaginations. They were vain. They were vain. What is the word vain? Prideful. Romans chapter 1, verse 21 says this. Also, the indictment. They allowed their hearts to become darkened. I mean, how dark is your life if even your heart is dark? Think about that. How dark is your life that even your heart is dark? That's dark. Six, they thought themselves to be wise, but became fools. Romans chapter 1, verse 22. The Greek word to become fools here is the word morano, a verb form of moros, from which we get the word moron. <laughs> They're idiots. And mentals. <laughs> they weren't smart. When the kind of, hey, if you knew you're going to end up in hell for the rest of the all eternity, wouldn't you? Say, hey, I want to get saved so I don't end up there. But these people don't care. These people do not care. Hell. Luke chapter 3 verse 17 says this. Whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor, and he will gather the wheat into his gardener, but the shaft he will burn with unquestionable fire. Revelation chapter 21 verse 8 says this, But the fearful, the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, the whoremongers, the sorcerers and idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Mark chapter 16, 16 says this, For the he that believes and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believes not shall be damned. Listen, guys, if there's a heaven for the saved, there's a hell for the damned. Matthew chapter 25, verse 46 says this, And all these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous unto eternal life. Matthew chapter 7, verse 2, oh, Jesus never talked about hell. Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 and 14 says this. Enter ye the straight gate, and wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there will go in there. Broad is the way to go to hell, and many go down through it. Mark chapter 9, verse 48 says this. Where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Matthew chapter 23, verse 15 says this, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye come past sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, you make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. Proverbs 1, chapter 1, verse 26 says this, I will also laugh in the day of your calamity, and I will mock you when your fear cometh. When your fear cometh as desolation, and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind. When distress and anguish come upon you, the Lord will laugh. He's warning you. He's kind of being mean about it, yes, I would agree. But he loves you enough to tell you the truth. Daniel chapter 12, verse 12, 2 says this, And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And lastly, he says this in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 28, He that despised Moses' law died without mercy, under two or three witnesses, 
How much more sore punishment suppose ye shall he brought worthy who has trodden underfoot the Son of God and has counted the blood of the covenant where ye were sanctified and an holy thing and done despite unto the Spirit of grace. Listen, guys, the Holy Spirit is calling you. He's calling you onto the wedding supper of the Lamb. If you're not born again, you're not going to heaven. Sorry to tell you. No matter how good you are, no matter how you, you think that you're doing good works, no matter if you, it doesn't matter anything. If you don't have the, Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then all of this will be added to you. What is seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness? His righteousness. That means put on his robe. Remember the Bible says that many will come to the wedding supper, but they didn't have the proper attire, and they were sent out. Many will come up to me, Lord, Lord! Double Lord. Not one. Two. Have we not prophesied in your name? Haven't we done great works in your name? Haven't we done so and so and so and so forth in your name? And when he says, depart from me, you worker of iniquity, why does he say worker of iniquity? Because they never had the proper attire. He says, he doesn't say you were saved and you lost your salvation. He says, I never knew you because you were never saved. And you were never saved. And you were never saved. You know, the saddest condition of man is to be in church once or twice a week and you never get saved. What were you doing there? What were you doing here? What were you... Really, what were you doing here if you never got saved? Think about it. If you were never born again, what were you doing here? Because you know what? There was a fresh aroma. But sadly, a stench of death came up to your nostrils. And where your lot is, is because you chose that lot. Not because you were never saved, because God didn't save you. It's because you never trust the final work of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary when he said, It is finished! What did he finish? He finished the whole wrath of God the Father upon himself. And he says, I lay down my life freely that I may take it up again. And he says, hey, I give you the word of God so you can preach it, so you can teach it, so you can live it, so you can be transformed in your life. Not so you can sit here and and, and gather with the... This is this ain't the... Moose is the Elks Lodge. This should be a place of refuge. This should be a place where you go to. And if you haven't been born again, I challenge you to receive the Lord Jesus Christ tonight. That you, maybe you are saved, but you want to get deeper with the Lord. Maybe the Lord spoke to you concerning your, your, your status. Maybe, maybe, maybe you haven't been putting the Lord first. Maybe you say you believe in the Lord, but... If, it was a, if this was a, a video game and the end of the game was level 10, you're, you, you started playing the game and you thought level 1 was where you stayed for the rest of your life. And God desires for you to get deeper in the Lord. And one thing video game has always taught me, this is what video games have taught me. I'm going to throw in the sermon. Yes, I'm going to throw a video game, ideology in the sermon. But when I, when, the, when, 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 I, when I used to play video games and, and I seen the big boss, I, I knew it was going the right direction. Because in the video games, any time you were just sitting there jumping up, looking for money, you knew that you weren't heading in the right direction. And when you met the boss, you knew that you had to kill him. Guys, we're being attacked. Me, Brother Felix, all of us, we're out there ministering on Saturdays and Fridays in the church and stuff. We're all getting attacked. By the enemy. Because we're doing the right thing. If you're not getting attacked, it's because you're not a threat. And you should be a threat. Because greater is he who's in you than he in the world. Amen? Amen. Let's finish right there. And now, raise your, now I'm going to pray for anybody, whoever wants to come up. Um, and, and, and maybe we'll, I'll, we'll pray for them and see what the Lord wants to do. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you, Father God, for the opportunity to preach the gospel, Lord. We thank you, Lord, Father God, for everybody who came tonight, Lord God, that you spoke to them, Lord God. I know it was a, 
It was a hard sermon to preach, Lord, but I did it out of my heart, Lord, because I care. And I want these people to be, uh, the, the, you might say, the core of the next core people that are going to come into your fold, Lord. And we know that we desire for people to be saved, Lord. We desire uh, for a workmanship in your life. There's a real need and there's a real hell for those who don't, Lord, and we want them to be saved. So, Lord, I also pray for anybody here tonight who doesn't know you, Father God. I pray, Lord, anybody who raises their hands right now, Father God, that you would quicken them, Father God. Whatever needs they're going through, Lord, whatever struggles they're going through, Lord, whatever. Uh, uh, I pray right now in Jesus' name that you would fill them, Lord God. Just raise your hand if you need that filling, Lord. Father. I, I, I believe that the Lord is able to fill that person, Lord. I pray that, Lord, that you would fill them, Lord, according to whatever need they have, Father God. Lord, if there's anybody here, Lord God, that's, that wants to draw closer to the Lord, we pray, Father God, that they would come to you in Scripture, Lord. That they would be renewed and transformed according to your word, Lord God. That they would put their faith, Lord God, in the word of God. By the way, it's called the infallible word of God for a reason, because 100% of your word always comes to pass. And we thank you, Lord God, that you are mightily, you're sovereign, you're uh, uh, omnipresent, you're omnipotent. You're the King of kings and Lord of lords. Bless those tonight, Father God, uh, again, that need you, Father Lord. If someone here has not been born again, Father God, I pray in Jesus' name, Lord, that they would call out to God and say, I'm a sinner. And only you, Lord, can, that who died for me, Lord, is able to save me. I trust what you did on the cross of Calvary. I believe that you, you were... You were in the grave for three days and three nights, Lord, Father God, and on the third day you rose from the grave, Lord, and you led the captives free. I believe, Father God, that you sit now at the right hand of God the Father, interceding, Lord, for those who are coming to your kingdom, Lord. And I pray, Father God, for all the people here tonight, Father God, that whatever trials are coming to, Father God, I pray for a hedge of protection as they go home, Lord, and we thank you, Father God, for the opportunity to serve you, Lord, and for the word. Bless us and guide us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you for coming. Yeah? Praise the Lord.